Hello, you're watching Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. How does 5G in our millimeter way provide critical additional network capacity when deployed in an operator's existing network in both indoor venues and outdoor environments, even in the presence of LTE and mid-band 5G NR? Well, to find out more and to discuss how the millimeter wave market is expanding and evolving, I'm joined by Michael Thielander, who is president of the Signals Research Group. Hello, Mike. Very good to meet you. Now, you've published a new white paper on 5G millimeter wave performance, and this is a year on from when we last spoke to you about a 5G millimeter wave benchmark study. So what's different about this year's report? Sure. So historically, when we do our benchmark studies, especially like the one we did last year, it's using a relatively small number of handsets and basically going in and looking at performance between 5G millimeter wave, different features that exist between, they say, the uplink and the downlink, and comparing that to LTE. What we did this year was dramatically different. So first of all, we started off with a large number of handsets. We tested in two different locations. Um, in both locations, we had anywhere between 15 to 20 smartphones on the network, be that LTE, mid-band 5G, or millimeter wave. And what that really allows you to do is really see how the network performs to really load it with a large num number of devices. So that's point number one. The second thing, which I think is probably just as interesting, if not more interesting, is that we did testing on millimeter wave in Europe. And historically, again, you know, most of our testing has been in the United States because that's where millimeter wave really took off to start. But this time around, you know, given some of the COVID restrictions that took place, but more importantly, the expansion of millimeter wave beyond North America, we actually went to Europe and did millimeter wave testing there as well. And I think those are really the, probably the two key differentiators in terms of what we did compared to uh, previous studies. So given this different approach and more extensive approach, what findings did you uncover? Sure, so let's start first of all, looking at the large number of devices that we had. You know, so that really allows you to load the network to really a term or determine the maximum capacity that exists. And so in Helsinki, when we did testing there, this was in an outdoor plaza. So it's a venue that people visit on a day-to-day -day basis. We did walk testing to really map out the coverage area of one LTE cell. And we did that with a large number of smartphones sitting in adjacent cells to really determine or to really introduce interference to determine the maximum capacity available in the LTE network. So now if you go back to kind of the early days of 3G, they used to talk about this coverage and capacity cake. And we basically did the same thing. What we did differently in our testing is actually this cake is based upon real world data. So again, we first of all did the walk testing, looking at the LTE maximum capacity, the total throughput that is available across that cell. And that became the coverage layer. So in this case, this was Elisa's network in Helsinki. They had 60 megahertz of spectrum available. On, the, on average, we got about 360 megabits per second of total throughput across this plaza area. And that's pretty impressive, but it really falls short when you look at the additional capacity requirements that are needed in the future. So then we switched to mid-band 5G. And in Elisa's case, they had 100 megahertz of TDD spectrum. So again, we did the same walk test. And what we found there, which I think is really quite interesting, is that the mid-band 5G coverage was almost identical to what we saw with LTE. Now, I guess there perhaps was a hotel located there. I would have gone inside the hotel I probably would have found a couple of rooms where there wasn't 5G coverage, but, but by and large, the coverage was identical. I think that's pretty important. And the reason that was the case is again, it was the high cell density that existed in the downtown Helsinki market. And so what we found there was basically about a, about a two to three X uh, increase in capacity that you get with mid-band 5G over LTE. And then we switched to 5G millimeter wave. And in this case, the operator had, had uh, two millimeter wave sites located, or two, two millimeter wave radios located at the same site where they had the LTE and mid-band 5G radio assets. And again, we, we repeated the walk test. And what we found here is that, of course, obviously, 
the coverage is not quite as, gay, as good as it was with both mid-band as well as LTE. It was roughly about half the total coverage area, but we saw basically a 10x increase in total capacity, which I really think is very important to recognize that even as operators deploy their mid-band spectrum, yes, they definitely get some additional capacity, but by and large, it's really not enough. And what we get with the millimeter wave um, coverage and capacity is really a 10x increase in capacity over LTE and about a 4x increase in capacity over what we get with mid-band 5G. Mike, that's absolutely fascinating information there and insights. Uh, 5G in our millimeter waves, it's still relatively new. So how is it evolving from a technology and a performance perspective? And how has it evolved over the past year? Sure. So let's go back even before that. So when the operators first started rolling out 5G millimeter wave, all of the uplink data traffic went over LTE. Now that quickly switched and operators started putting the uplink data traffic over 5G millimeter wave. Last year, when we did our study, they were just getting ready to introduce the use of two carriers in the uplink. So basically with millimeter wave, in the case of both ELISA and Verizon Wireless, they have 800 megahertz of spectrum. So that 800 megahertz of spectrum is providing capacity in the downlink, but in the uplink, originally it was only 100 megahertz of spectrum. So that really kind of limits your uplink performance. Last year, when we did the study, the operators were just starting to introduce a second carrier, basically increasing that to 200 megahertz of, of spectrum in the uplink. Now what we're finding today is that it's actually being more widely deployed across operators' networks. Um, since we've done this study, and this is a little bit of a tangent here, I've done additional testing that really looks at the introduction of 400 megahertz of spectrum on, L on 5G in the uplink. That again can almost double your total capacity available on the uplink channel. In addition to that, and again, this is testing that I've done since the white paper, but also important to note, is that we're now starting to see operators and vendors looking at the merging of both mid-band 5G as well as millimeter waves. So you, you can combine the radio assets of both through a feature called NRDC or new radio dual connectivity and basically use both technologies or both spectrum bands to serve the same individual mobile device. Basically, you're having your cake and eating it too, if you will, in terms of the total potential you get, both from the coverage you get from mid-band 5G, as well as the, uh, the introduction of millimeter wave, providing that additional capacity layer. And then, of course, I guess, setting aside the technology, there's really the market aspect. You know, seeing millimeter wave being deployed in Europe, that's something we didn't see a year ago. And I think also it's just kind of the expansion of the ecosystem. I mean, seeing more vendors on the infrastructure side, on the device side, on the chipset side, starting to introduce millimeter wave functionality, that's really gonna be critical to the overall success of the feature. Now, Mike, we, we hear a lot about millimeter wave in the US, and as you just said uh, about moving out in, into Europe, how do you see millimeter wave expanding into these markets such as Europe, where you've been recently testing? Yeah, so I, I think right now, a lot of it is more kind of a trialing, if you will. I mean, I think the sites that I tested in Elisa's network, they were commercially available to users, but it's still something that they're experimenting with. I think one thing that's really interesting is their interest in fixed wireless access. You know, so if you look at, at North America, I think operators originally were focused on kind of, you know, mobile broadband, you know, serving the smartphone. And then they started from there moving on to looking at fixed wireless access. I think Europe is a little bit different here and, and we'll see what happens here, but just given the press releases I've seen and talking with the operators, you know, given that they already have mid-band, you know, 5G available there, I think their initial focus is to see what can this technology do for me when it comes to delivering fixed wireless access services, and then also augmenting that with its support for, for mobile broadband and actually serving the smartphones. Well, building on what you've just said there, can you expand a little on the benefits of 5G in our millimeter wave in a network that already has mid-band 5G? Sure, I mean, it's really all about capacity. You know, so you take a leases network. I mean, they probably have the typical allocation of spectrum between LTE and mid-band, you know, having 60 megahertz of LTE, having 
100 megahertz of, of mid-band. You know, but what we see here, and going back to that, that layered cake again, it's really only increasing their capacity density by about two to three X. Now you look at the growth in mobile data traffic, they're very quickly gonna blow through that additional capacity. What millimeter wave buys you is really that additional capacity layer. You may not need it today, you may not need it tomorrow, but in the very near future, you know, operators are gonna to start to run out of capacity in their LTE and mid-band 5G networks. What millimeter wave does for them is provide that additional capacity really where they need it. So if it gives operators this capacity, and you've, you've already spoken about what you found in Helsinki, where you, you had 10 times uh, increasing in capacity, what actual need is there from users for the high data speeds that millimeter wave offers? Sure, so I, this is probably a little bit controversial, but I guess I would ar actually argue there isn't a need for gigabit per second type data speeds. I mean, yes, you can go to a, a speed test and, and push the button and, and see those kind of speeds, but once you actually switch gears and go to an application, the bandwidth consumption is far less than that. So we did testing in Phoenix. This was at the Footprint Center, which is home to the uh, Phoenix Suns. And there we actually took a large number of smartphones, loaded up the network, and we looked at the performance with very basic applications that were focused on video. So as an example, we'll take YouTube Live. So if you're doing YouTube Live streaming, in our case, it required about 12 megabits per second of uplink bandwidth to actually deliver a very good user experience and actually cache it on the internet. That worked fine and good on LTE. You didn't need millimeter wave. Now, you, now we started loading up the LTE network, went back and repeated the test. And what we found is that the performance was actually very bad, you know, due to buffering, freezing, stalling, et cetera. We turned on millimeter wave, problem solved. So in this case, millimeter wave is not necessarily generating a lot of bandwidth for the smartphone. The application is only consuming you know, 10, 15 megabits per second, but it's doing it in a consistent manner. And we saw the same thing on the downlink. So now you can imagine watching a video at you know, 10, 20 you know, megabits per second kind of consumption rate. That works fine on LTE. You don't need millimeter wave for that. But again, you start loading up the network with the small number of smartphones that we had in one concentrated area and very quickly, the user experience became poor because the LTE network really lacked the spectrum. It lacked the capacity to, de to deliver even those very modest data speeds. Again, turning on millimeter wave and the problem was solved. So I guess I would argue, you know, millimeter wave is not so much about delivering very high peak data speeds to one smartphone or a handful of smartphones. It's really about the capacity that it offers for a large number of smartphones to consume it and to benefit from it. But what about the coverage of millimeter wave? Because there are propagation challenges here, aren't there? There's, there's line of sight, buildings, material, weather conditions, and so on. Sure, yeah, I mean, that, that's always a question that comes up. And we've done a lot of testing here, even going back to the days of, you know, 5G TF with Verizon and going out and looking at it. And I would argue that, you know, people really need to go out and experiment on their own. I mean, 5G millimeter wave is never gonna provide the coverage of a low band technology. It's, it's, that's just a fact of life, but it's actually far more robust than people realize. And I think a couple of examples here. So in the venue we tested in Phoenix, I mean, it's ideal. I mean, your, your millimeter wave radios are mounted in the rafters, it's line of sight. You have a very large concent concentration of people there. It's ideal, there's no problem whatsoever. You basically have ubiquitous coverage across the entire venue. That's true for soccer stadiums, football stadiums, you name it. The other interesting anecdote, and this goes back to the testing we did in Helsinki, in doing a walk test there, you go back to that layered cake figure that we showed, I mean, definitely the, the coverage was about half that that we saw for both LTE and mid-band 5G. But interestingly enough, there were actually areas where we tested where we had millimeter wave coverage from that, uh, from that location where the radios were located, but we didn't have coverage from both mid-band and LTE. Yes, we had actually had connectivity there, but that signal was coming from a different cell site. So in this case, where we actually had the millimeter wave coverage, I went back and I looked at the map and I could clearly see there was a building between us and the, the location of the radio. The only way we could maintain that connection 
was a reflection coming off the building across the street. So again, yes, millimeter wave is not going to be a technology that goes for miles and miles to a smartphone, but it's definitely far more robust than I think people realize. You know, we also did some testing inside. You know, we did, I did testing in Helsinki, you know, going inside a coffee shop, going inside a Burger King. We did some video testing there. Yes, I was sitting, you know, relatively close to the window, but it wasn't like you necessarily needed to have line of sight be outside to get the con connection to the 5G millimeter wave radio. And again, to the extent where you don't have coverage, you know, where you do have coverage at least, that's where you're offloading the capacity onto the millimeter wave radio, thereby allowing those users that can't tap into the millimeter wave spectrum because they're too far away to reap the full benefits of both LTE and mid-band 5G. And Mike, if you look ahead now, how do you see the market evolution of both mid-band and 5G in our millimeter wave? Yeah, so I think it's really a question of the haves and the have-nots. If you look at the U.S. in particular uh, with, with Verizon, AT&T, you know, even to some extent T-Mobile, they really didn't have the mid-band spectrum available at the time. You know, uh, T-Mobile got it, of course, when they when they acquired uh, Sprint's assets at 2.5 gigahertz, but they were, you know, basically 5G millimeter wave was really their only option for getting 5G out to the mass market. And you you switch gears to to Europe, Asia, and elsewhere they had the mid-band spectrum, they didn't have millimeter wave. And so of course their focus was really on, on the mid-band assets. I think what's gonna happen over time is that, you know, the US operators, now that they're getting more of the mid-band spectrum, they're gonna be putting, you know, equal focus or more so on the mid-band spectrum. And then, you know, obviously augmenting that with the millimeter wave frequencies. I think in Europe, you know, they've deployed a lot of their mid-band spectrum, you know, and then again, over time, they're going to switch gears and start looking at millimeter wave because that's kind of the next the next frontier, if you will, for them. And then using that that technology, using that spectrum, you know, both for fixed wireless access, probably to start, but again, again, solving some of the capacity needs that they have that operators are facing in the United States. And finally, how can viewers access the report? Sure. So you can access the uh, the white paper from our website. That's uh, signalsresearch.com. Excellent. Well, we'll add a link to the text field description below this video as well. It's a fascinating and very detailed white paper. Thank you, Mike, for joining us on the program today. Thank you.